Welcome to Washington Today on C-SPAN Radio for Wednesday, May 3rd, 2023. Federal Reserve raises interest rates by another quarter percentage point and suggests that its string of interest rate hikes, now at 10 straight, could be paused if high inflation continues to ease. Coming up, the Fed Chair Jerome Powell's news conference talking about not only interest rates and inflation, but lessons from the recent bank failures and the effect of possibly not raising the country's debt ceiling. With the White House and congressional Republicans still at odds over whether or not to include spending reforms with a debt limit increase. Senate voting on whether to restore import tariffs on solar panels from four southeast Asian nations, in which Chinese companies have operations. This is the latest in a series of votes in Congress to overturn Biden administration regulations. Senate Democrats announced they'll be writing legislation designed to limit U.S. capital and technology from going to China. This has been dubbed CHIPS 2.0 bill. Some Senate Republicans calling on the Biden administration not to let the Title 42 regulation expire next week, a public health rule that has kept 2 million migrants from entering the U.S. from Mexico the past few years. Secretary of State Antony Blinken on this World Press Freedom Day, remembering Wall Street Journal reporter Evan Gershkovich languishing in a Russian prison. U.S. reaction to Russia's claim that Ukraine tried to assassinate Russian President Vladimir Putin using drones. And former Maryland Governor Larry Hogan says he'll not be running for the U.S. Senate in 24 in the open seat created by Democratic Senator Ben Cardin's retirement. And we start with the Federal Reserve Chair Jerome Powell, a news conference at the Fed building in Washington today, announcing the latest interest rate hike. Today, the FOMC raised its policy interest rate by a quarter percentage point. Since early last year, we've raised interest rates by a total of five percentage points in order to attain a stance of monetary policy that is sufficiently restrictive to return inflation to 2% over time. We are also continuing to reduce our securities holdings, Looking ahead, we'll take a data-dependent approach in determining the extent to which additional policy firming may be appropriate. Federal Reserve Chair Jerome Powell, this interest rate hike by the Fed raises the benchmark rate to a range of 5% to 5.25%, the highest in 17 years. Wall Street reaction, the Dow down 270, NASDAQ down 55, S&P down 28. United Press International reporting while inflation has slowed, it is still higher than the 2% mark that the Fed hopes to achieve. Fed Chair Jerome Powell also is facing pressure from politicians to stop raising rates as fears of a recession increase. On Tuesday, Democratic Senators Elizabeth Warren, Bernie Sanders, Sheldon Whitehouse, and other lawmakers sent a letter to Jerome Powell saying that the Federal Reserve's aggressive actions were threatening to throw millions of people out of work. That from UPI. First question from a reporter to the Fed chair at his news conference today was about the chances of a recession and also the plan for interest rate increases going forward. Hi, Gina Smilik, New York Times. Thanks for taking our questions. I wonder if you could tell us whether we should read the statement today as a suggestion that the committee is prepared to pause interest rate increases in June. And I also wonder if the Fed staff has in any way revised their forecast for a mild recession from the March minutes. And if so, what a recession, like what they're envisioning, would look and feel like when it comes to, for example, the unemployment rate? So... uh Taking your question, of course, today our decision was to raise the federal funds rate by 25 basis points. Uh, a, a, a decision on a pause was not made today. Uh, you will have noticed that uh, in the in the uh, statement from March, we had a sentence that said the committee anticipates that some additional policy firming may be appropriate. That sentence is is not in in the statement anymore. We took that out, and instead we're saying that in determining the extent to which additional policy firming may be appropriate to return inflation at 2% over time, the committee will take into account certain factors. So we th- that's, a, that's a meaningful change that we, we're no longer saying that we anticipate. And uh, so we'll be driven by incoming data, meeting by meeting, and uh, you know we'll approach that question at the June meeting. Uh, so the, the, um, the staff's uh, forecast is, so. Let me say, start by saying that that's not my own most likely uh, case, which is really that, that, that the economy will continue to grow at, at a modest rate this year. And I think that's uh, so 
different people on the committee have different forecasts. That's, that's my own assessment of the most likely path. Staff produces its own forecast, and it's independent of the forecasts of, of the uh, participants, which include the governors and the Reserve Bank presidents, of course. And we think this is a healthy thing, that the, that the staff is writing down what they really think. They're not especially influenced by what the governors think, and vice versa. The governors are not taking what the staff says and just writing that down. So it's actually good that, that the staff and individual participants uh, can have different perspectives. Um, so broadly, uh, the, the forecast was for a mild recession, and by that I would characterize as one in which the rise in unemployment is smaller than is, has been typical in modern era uh, recessions. Um, I, I wouldn't want to characterize the, the, the staff's uh, uh, forecast for this meeting. We'll, we'll leave that to the minutes, but broadly, broadly similar to that. The Federal Reserve Chair Jerome Powell at a news conference today. He also talked about bank failures and said the U.S. banking system is sound and resilient and about the J.P. Morgan Chase buying of First Republic Bank this past weekend. I think it's good policy that we don't want the largest banks making big acquisitions, but this was an exception for a failing bank. Federal Reserve recently completed a deeper look into the failure of Silicon Valley Bank and the lessons learned, a reporter asking the Fed chair about that. Steve Leisman, CNBC. Can you t- tell us what the Federal Reserve Board did in the wake of that February presentation where you were informed that Silicon Valley Bank and other banks were experiencing <coughs> interest rate risks? And can you tell me what supervisory actions you've done in the wake of the recent bank failures to make sure that banks are currently appropriately managing interest rate risk? And kind of part three, but it's all the same question here. Do you still think this separation principle that monetary policy and supervision can be handled with different tools? Thank you. Sure. So the February 14th presentation, I didn't remember it very well, but now, of course, I've gone back and looked at it very carefully. I did remember it. And what it was was a general presentation. It was an informational briefing of the whole board, the entire board. I think all members were there. And uh, it was about interest rate risk in the banks. And and, – lots of data, and there was one page on Silicon Valley Bank which talked about, uh, you know, the um, amount of losses they – or uh, mark-to-market losses they had in their portfolio. There was nothing in it about uh, – that I recall, anyway, about um, about the risk of a bank run. So it was – I think the takeaway was they were going away to do a, an assessment, a vertical uh, – sorry, a horizontal assessment of, of banks. It wasn't um, – it, it, it wasn't presented as an urgent or alarming situation. It was presented as, a, as, a, as an informational, non-decisional kind of a thing, and I thought it was a, a good presentation and, and uh, as I said, did remember it. Um, in terms of what we're doing, of course, uh, I think banks themselves are, are – many, many banks are now uh, are attending to liquidity and uh, taking opportunity now, really, since, uh, since the events of, of early March to, to build liquidity. Um, and. Um, you asked about the separation principle. I, you know, I, I, like so many things, it, it's very useful, um, but, you know, ultimately it has its limits. I mean, I, I think in this particular case, we have found that uh, the monetary policy tools and the financial stability tools are not in conflict. They're both – they're working well together. We've used our, our uh, financial stability tools to support banks through our lending facilities. And um, at the same time, we've been able to uh, use our monetary policy tools to foster maximum employment and price stability. Mr. Chairman, I'm sorry, but I've got the microphone. Thank you. I don't mean to be argumentative, but the, the staff report said SVB has significant interest rate risk. It said interest rate risk measurements failed at SVB, and it said banks with large unrealized losses face significant safety and soundness risk. Why was that not alarming? Well, I mean, I didn't say it wasn't alarming. It was – they're pointing out something that they're working on and that they're on the case that, that you know, that uh, – I'm not sure whether they mentioned um, – I think they did, actually. They mentioned um, that they had taken regulatory action matter – or supervisory action in the form of matters requiring attention. So I think that was also in the presentation. I think it, it was to say, yes, this is a bank and there are many other banks that are experiencing this – these things and, and we're on the case. The Federal Reserve Chair Jerome Powell holding a news conference today at the Fed building in Washington, D.C. He was also asked about possible consequences of not raising the national debt ceiling, 
The Treasury Department warning that the debt ceiling needs to be raised or suspended by as early as June 1st to avoid a default on the U.S. debt. The U.S. actually hit the statutory borrowing limit in January and has been using what the Treasury Department calls extraordinary measures to pay the bills. There is a continuing standoff between President Biden and congressional Republicans. Congressional Republicans want to include some spending cuts to a debt ceiling increase. They've passed a bill that has four and a half trillion dollars worth. But the congressional Democrats and the president want a standalone bill. Here's the question to the Fed chair. Thank you, Chair Powell. Rachel Siegel from The Washington Post. Thanks for taking our questions. I'm wondering if you can talk about the account of possible effects of a debt limit standoff. You've said repeatedly that the ceiling must be raised, but do you see any economics effects of even getting close to a default, and what type of situation would that look like? Um, So I I wouldn't want to speculate specifically, but I will say this. Um, These are fiscal policy matters, for starters, and they're uh, they're for Congress and the administration for the elected parts of the government to deal with. and. and, uh, they're really cons- you know, consigned to them. From our standpoint, I, w- I would just say this. It's essential that, that the debt ceiling be raised in a timely way so that the U.S. government can pay all of its bills when they're due. A failure to do that would be unprecedented. Uh, we'd be in uncharted territory, and the, and the consequences to the U.S. economy would be highly uncertain and could, could be quite averse. So uh, I'll just leave it there. We, um, we don't give advice to either side. Um, we just would point out that, it, that it's very important that this be done. And the, the, the other point I'll, I'll make about that, though, is that no one should assume that the Fed can protect the economy from the potential you know, short and long-term effects of a failure to pay our bills on time. We, we, uh, uh, it's, it would be so uncertain that it's just as important that, that this we never get to a place where we're actually talking about or even having a situation where the U.S. government's not paying its bills. And just to follow up, Was discussion around the uncertainty of a possible standoff, did that affect today's monetary policy decision at all? I wouldn't say that it did. It was, of course, it's something that came up. We talk a lot about risks uh, to the to the outlook, and that that will that come up. A number of people did raise that as a risk to the outlook. I wouldn't say that it was important in today's uh, monetary policy decision yet. Federal Reserve Chair Jerome Powell. You can find his full news conference at cspan.org. It runs about 50 minutes. Again, the headline from it. They raised interest rates again by another quarter percentage point and changed the terminology for what's going to happen in the future, saying it'll depend upon the economic data, whether more interest rate hikes are coming. On that debt ceiling issue ahead of next Tuesday's meeting at the White House with the president and bipartisan leaders of the House and Senate, more news conferences and statements today from the various sides laying out positions. A group of Senate Republicans holding a news conference on the grounds of the U.S. Capitol building. Here is Senator J.D. Vance of Ohio. House Republicans have done something very simple, but I think very profound. They've advanced a program that pays the country's debts while putting the country on a more sustainable path financially. And what Joe Biden has done is refuse to negotiate from the very beginning. He's basically playing Russian roulette with the country's finances and telling Republicans they need to do exactly what he wants them to do or he's going to drive the American economy off a cliff. What Kevin McCarthy and House Republicans just did is save the president of the United States from his own failure of leadership. This could have been a very productive process if Joe Biden from the get-go had shown some leadership, which is what you should expect from the president of the United States. Instead, he put it all on House Republicans to come to a negotiated deal, and that's exactly what they did. The last thing I want to say, I echo everybody's comments from, from, from earlier. Last thing I want to say is I've heard a lot of criticisms from Democrats about things they don't like in this package. I guarantee you all 217 Republicans who voted for it didn't like at least one thing in the package. But they came together because paying the country's debts and doing our job as leadership is more important than any single person. Joe Biden should take a cue from congressional Republicans, show some leadership, come to the table. The country needs him to do exactly that. Senator J.D. Vance, Republican from Ohio, joining other Senate Republicans at a news conference today outside the U.S. Capitol in Washington. A story from NBC News, a number of Senate Republicans rejected the idea of lifting the debt ceiling temporarily to buy Congress more time to negotiate a larger measure with the White House that could prevent a default. Several GOP lawmakers said that pushing back the deadline will only shift negotiations into the future because Washington is known for addressing these crises 
at the last minute. And the New York Times reports that the Biden administration is considering a legal challenge stating that the concept of the debt limit is unconstitutional, thereby ignoring it. The theory is based on a clause in the 14th Amendment that reads the validity of the public debt of the United States authorized by law, including debt incurred for payment of pensions and bounties for services in suppressing insurrection or rebellion, shall not be questioned. A question about this today to the White House Press Secretary, Corrine Jean-Pierre. Just on the debt limit, there are conversations that have been reported about potentially invoking the 14th Amendment, which would essentially allow the president to deal with this debt limit crisis unilaterally. Can you characterize how serious those discussions are? Have they gone all the way up to the level of the president? So look, we're not going to entertain scenarios where Congress compromises the full uh, credit, the full faith and credit of the United States. Uh, we've been very clear from here, the president has been very clear that Congress must act. This is their constitutional duty uh, to act, and uh, we must avoid uh, catastrophic threats to our economy. Uh, that needs to happen. And what this will do, uh, it will hurt the American people, cost more than six million jobs, and threaten Social Security, uh, threaten Medi Medicare and Medicaid payments. And so we're just not going to ta entertain scenarios. Does that mean you've taken invoking the 14th Amendment? What I'm saying table? is that I, I'm not going to certainly uh, negotiate from here or, or do anything like that. We're just not going to entertain scenarios. This is their constitutional duty. And I've said this before. Republicans did this three times. They were able uh, to do this. Uh, Democrats joined them three times uh, in the last administration. White House Press Secretary Corrine Jean-Pierre at her news conference in the White House briefing room. The Senate Majority Leader Chuck Schumer has declared that the bill that passed the House, written by Republicans, combining a debt limit increase with spending cuts, is dead on arrival in the Senate. But the Senate Budget Committee plans to hold a hearing on Thursday on the bill. The House Republicans named that bill Limit Save Grow Act. In the announcement of this hearing, the Senate Democratic Majority calls it the Default on America Act. You can listen to that Senate Budget Committee hearing on C-SPAN Radio Thursday at 10 a.m. Eastern. It'll also be on C-SPAN Television, on the C-SPAN Now mobile app, and you can listen on your smart speaker. Just say, play C-SPAN Radio. As the back and forth continues over the debt ceiling and the budget, the heads of cabinet departments and major federal agencies have been going to Capitol Hill to testify about President Biden's proposed fiscal year 2024 budget. Today, the EPA Administrator Michael Regan was before the Senate Appropriations Subcommittee that oversees the Environmental Protection Agency, talking about the president's request for $12 billion for the EPA next year. That's 19 percent more than the current year. The subcommittee chair, Senator Jeff Merkley, Democrat from Oregon, asking Administrator Regan about that House Republican bill that would limit growth in discretionary federal spending. I'll just begin, Administrator Regan, uh, by asking you about the House majority proposal to freeze funding to FY22 levels. And a consequence is it would translate to EPA state, tribal, and local grant and infrastructure accounts uh, by nearly, it would cut it by nearly a billion dollars, including a $600 million cut on the program that would replace lead pipes and upgrade drinking water systems and support other water infrastructure. Uh, it seems like that's at odds with bipartisan support for water infrastructure. And, uh, but I wanted to see, uh, see uh, or ha give you an opportunity to clarify what that House proposal, uh, proposed level would do. Well, thank you for the question. And, and our job is fundamentally about keeping people safe to safeguard uh, the very things that we all as Americans hold dear, uh, like the insurance that when our children turn on their tap water, the water they drink will be clean, or when they play outside, the air that they breathe will be safe. Um, undoubtedly, if we were to roll back the budget to 2022 levels, it would force us to make some very difficult, difficult decisions in terms of protecting the health and safety of all Americans. Uh, it would also cut uh, hundreds of millions of dollars from programs uh, that impact the market. Uh, we understand that there are pesticides and herbicides that need to make it to the markets to uh, give all of our farmers the tools that they need uh, to be successful uh, to feed this country. And so uh, there will be significant impacts on the EPA's ability 
to put uh, significant products on the market, uh, to continue to help this country be competitive from a global economic standpoint, uh, but more importantly, uh, sacrifice potentially the health and safety of some of our fellow citizens. So if I can simplify just to the lead pipes issue, since that is uh, and a condition that you know, affects the developing brains of our babies and our, our children has been a big concern. Would that proposal significantly cut the removal of lead pipes, resulting in more damage to more children? It absolutely will. Thank you. EPA Administrator Michael Regan testifying before the Appropriations Subcommittee that handles the EPA budget. Questions from the chair, Senator Jeff Merkley, Democrat from Oregon. Story from Politico, as Republicans in Congress try to dismantle the regulatory framework they rail against, they're also handing red state Democrats up for re-election next year, chance after chance to buck their party, break with the president, and burnish their aisle-crossing bona fides. The Senate will take up two resolutions today to roll back Biden administration rules, one to repeal the president's two-year pause on new tariffs for Chinese manufacturers routing solar panels through Southeast Asian countries, and another to nullify the Endangered Species Act protections of the lesser prairie chicken. That's from Politico. The Senate Minority Leader Mitch McConnell, Republican from Kentucky, spoke about these resolutions today. Here is the part about the solar panel tariffs. Last June, President Biden issued an emergency proclamation to let unfairly traded Chinese solar panels enter U.S. markets without additional tariffs that should have applied. In other words, the Democrats went soft on China for the sake of their Green New Deal daydreams. At the time, President Biden's own Commerce Department was investigating Chinese producers for circumventing solar panel tariffs by rerouting products through other countries. American workers and manufacturers were counting on the results of that investigation to reestablish a fair and level playing field. And in December, a preliminary report did find, did find that Chinese companies had cheated. But the administration threw in the towel and gave China a win. Today, the Senate can join the House and take bipartisan action to freeze the president's so-called emergency proclamation and make his administration hold China unfair trade practices actually to account. I hope each of my colleagues will join me in supporting both of these common sense resolutions. The Senate Republican leader Mitch McConnell on the Senate floor, those tariffs being restored through this resolution would apply to Cambodia, Malaysia, Thailand, and Vietnam. More from the Politico article, Republicans are using the Congressional Review Act, a tool the minority can use to force votes on rolling back recently enacted rules within a tight window of time. CRAs just need a simple majority, so there's no filibuster threat. And the measures are considered a privilege resolution, which compels the majority to schedule a vote, even without Senate Democratic leadership supporting the move. Opposing the resolution on the solar panel tariffs on the Senate floor, Senator Sheldon Whitehouse, Democrat from Rhode Island. This fossil fuel attack through this CRA, if successful, would lead to more than a billion dollars in retroactive duties on American solar companies. It would cost us 30,000 jobs. It would cost us $4.2 billion in domestic investment. It would lead to the cancellation of four gigawatts of solar projects, and it would create an increase of 42 million metric tons of CO2. So, of course, the fossil fuel industry is against all of that. It's for the duties, it's against the jobs, it's against the investment, It's against the solar projects, and it couldn't care less about CO2. So the problem that we have here is that we are in a race against time to solve the climate problem before it gets out of hand. Senator Sheldon Whitehouse, Democrat, on the Senate floor. Several other Senate Democrats say they're going to support this resolution and restore those tariffs on solar panels from the, from the four Southeast Asian nations. As was noted by the Senate Minority Leader Mitch McConnell, this bill, this resolution has already passed the House. 
But if it passes the Senate, President Biden has threatened to veto it, and a veto override would require a two-thirds vote of each chamber. U.S. Senate Democrats writes Reuters launched a renewed effort to stave off competition from China on Wednesday, planning legislation to boost the country's ability to face up to the Asian powerhouse on issues from technology to security and threats to Taiwan. Senator Schumer, the majority leader, Democrat from New York, said this bill dubbed China Competition 2.0 would broaden last year's Chips and Science Act. We are announcing a new initiative one that will build on this momentum and develop new and significant bipartisan legislation that includes hearings, markups, working directly together with our Republican colleagues to build and move legislation. In recent weeks, I have met with and tasked a number of our chairs, many of them are here today, to reach out to their ranking members and other Republicans and begin working to deliver packages of bipartisan legislation which we will combine into one large Chinese government competition bill um, in coming months. We have five key areas we are focusing on. First, limiting the flow of advanced technology to the Chinese government. We will work to halt the Chinese government's development of advanced technologies that we know will shape the course of this century. We need to build on the kinds of actions like the Biden administration's export control rule to block the flow of chip tooling technology to China. I've asked Chairs Brown and Menendez to look at authorities in their respective jurisdictions to strengthen export control laws and identify new sanctions that may be needed and counter Chinese government coercion. Two, we want to limit the flow of investment to the Chinese government. It's incumbent on us to ensure that the U.S. is not the financial lifeblood supporting the Chinese government and its military technological advancement. We must make sure that we can prevent the Chinese government from using our own free society to acquire and even steal U.S. innovations and critical technologies. This means giving the Secretaries of Treasury and Commerce new authorities to screen and, where appropriate, halt the flow of capital to China's high-tech industries. Senators Casey and Cornyn have a strong bipartisan bill here that will help. I've talked to Senator Cornyn. He's very interested in working with us on this. Three, domestic economic investments. We all know that it's critical to invest in the industries of the future here in America. Chips and science and the IRA are already creating vital investments across our country. But to ensure these gains are felt by American families and not outsourced to benefit foreign entities and fully fund the science investment from last year's bipartisan bill, we have to move further. We need our chairs to keep identifying critical vulnerabilities, including assistance for small business and, very important, building a workforce for the future. We need also to further strengthen the CFIUS process. Senators Peters, Cantwell, Murray, Cardin, and Warner are already doing good work here. Four, economic ally and partner alignment. It's vital that the United States provide a a stark and credible alternative to the Chinese government's so-called Belt and Road Initiative, seeking to expand their influence around the globe. We have allies and partners who stand ready and willing to work with us to provide a positive alternative to China that actually benefits those countries looking for a helping hand. And now is the time for us to harness those potential alternatives. And finally, security ally and partner alignment. We must continue to deter the Chinese government from any conflict with Taiwan. Chairs Menendez, Warner, Murray, and Reid have worked on this. Last year, Chairman Menendez and Ranking Member Risch had good proposals. They didn't make it into legislation, but that's a good basis for us to work in this area. So, bottom line, time's not on our side. The Xi regime is working every day to catch up and surpass the United States. There is no reason our two parties here in the Congress and in the Senate can't come together and send a strong message to the Chinese government that we're united in in this pressing national security effort and we are committed to maintaining America's lead in the future. The Senate Majority Leader Chuck Schumer, Democrat from New York, at a news conference today in the U.S. Capitol with the Democratic senators who chair the committees that will be working on this bill. 
Returning to the Reuters news article about this legislation, John Thune of South Dakota, the Senate's number two Republican, said the new China initiative would have a hard time getting through Congress given his party's concerns about spending and the debt and the size of last year's bill. He said it would be challenging and partly because of spending and debt, concerns about too much spending and the impact it's had on inflation, the way the deficits exploded and ballooned. A few other notes about the economy. ADP, Human Resources Company, says 296,000 private sector jobs were created in April. That's up from 142,000 in March. The U.S. Labor Department's jobs report for April will come out on Friday. And the World Bank Board of Governors has confirmed Ajay Bangda for the bank's next president. He takes over for David Malpass on June 2nd to begin a five-year term. He was nominated by President Biden, who put out a statement reading in part that he'll be a transformative leader, bringing expertise, experience and innovation to the position of the World Bank president. And together with World Bank leadership and shareholders, he will help steer the institution as it evolves and expands to address global challenges that directly affect its core mission of poverty reduction, including climate change. That part of the statement from President Biden. Washington Today continues in a moment. There are a lot of places to get political information, but only at C-SPAN do you get it straight from the source. No matter where you are from or where you stand on the issues, C-SPAN is America's network. Unfiltered, unbiased, word for word. If it happens here or here or here or anywhere that matters, America is watching on C-SPAN, powered by cable. Welcome back to Washington Today, which you can get as a podcast wherever you get your podcasts and on the C-SPAN Now mobile app. Story from Fox News. Republican senators led by Lindsey Graham of South Carolina are urging President Biden to reverse his decision to end the Title 42 public health order next week amid fears that there could be a massive spike in migration to the border once it's terminated. They sent a letter reading... We write today to implore you to reverse your decision to end the Title 42 public health order set to expire on May 11th. According to the Department of Homeland Security's own estimates, border surges in response to the termination of Title 42 could reach 13,000 encounters with illegal immigrants a day. This is untenable and will exacerbate what is already a national security and humanitarian disaster on our southern border. Part of the letter from the Republican senators as reported by Fox News. Senator Graham led a news conference today with other Senate Republicans. Brownsville, Laredo, and El Paso have declared states of emergency because they know what's coming uh, May the 11th. These cities are being overrun. They're having more capacity than they can handle. Crime is up. Disruption in these cities are ju- is just really out of control. I'll turn it over to John here in a second. He can talk better about Texas. But to the Biden administration, what the hell has to happen for you to change policy? At what point are you going to take this seriously? At what point are you going to rise to the occasion? America is under siege here. and You're sitting fiddling while everybody is burning in America. So what we hope to do is to beg and plead with this administration. I've asked Democrats to join the effort to not repeal Title 42, May the 11th. It's been used 2.3 million times to expel people who came here illegally. That authority goes away next week. So it's not like it doesn't matter. It's been used by the administration probably more than any tool in the toolbox, and they're taking out of the toolbox one of the most effective tools they have to deter illegal immigration. And come next week, all hell is going to break loose along the border and eventually will flow into the interior of the United States. About solving illegal immigration, John and I have sat down with Democrats for over a decade now trying to fix this problem. This is a self-inflicted wound by the Biden administration. They have the power to continue this policy. They have the power by executive action to keep people out of the country when they, when they want to claim asylum. They repeal the Trump policies that led to the lowest illegal crossings in December of 2020 in recent history. It was a choice they made. This has got nothing to do with Congress 
acting or not acting. This is a conscious decision by the Biden administration to take a tool out of the toolbox that's been very effective, and it's going to lead to holy hell. Senator Lindsey Graham, Republican from South Carolina, at a news conference today on Capitol Hill. You mentioned John, that's Senator John Cornyn, Republican from Texas, also there, and the other senator from Texas, Ted Cruz, also Republican, joining them later. Associated Press writes that U.S. and Mexico officials have agreed on new immigration policies meant to deter illegal border crossings while also opening up other pathways ahead of an expected increase in migrants following the end of the pandemic restrictions next week. Homeland Security Advisor Lynn Sherwood Randall spent Tuesday meeting with Mexico's President Andres Manuel López Obrador and other top officials, emerging with a five-point plan, according to statements from both nations. Under the agreement, Mexico will continue to accept migrants from Venezuela, Haiti, Cuba, and Nicaragua who are turned away at the border, and up to 100,000 individuals from Honduras, Guatemala, and El Salvador who have family in the U.S. will be eligible to live and work there. President Biden recognizing World Press Freedom Day today by calling a free press a pillar of democracy and highlighting the case of Wall Street Journal reporter Evan Gershkovich, jailed in Russia for over a month on charges of espionage, and freelancer Austin Tice, kidnapped in 2012 while reporting in Syria. President Biden in a statement saying that Evan Gershkovich and Austin Tice weigh heavily on my mind today. No family should have to endure the pain I've seen their families bear. But in far too many places around the world, autocrats and their enablers continue to repress a free and independent media through censorship, retribution, threats, lawsuits, harassment, disinformation, detention, and physical attacks. Secretary of State Antony Blinken also talking about these two cases in a conversation with Washington Post Associate Editor David Ignatius. Here's a portion on Evan Gershkovich. We're intensely engaged with uh, the Russians to seek, his, uh, to seek his freedom, to seek his immediate release. Short of that, just to get what Russia's obligated to provide, which is consular access, which they've done once but have uh, yet to repeat. Uh, our ambassador, Lynn Tracy, had a chance to be with Evan about uh, 10 days ago, found him of incredibly uh, strong of, of mind and spirit. Um, which is uh, a very powerful thing in this, in this situation. But uh, we have a country, in the case of, uh, of Russia, that, like a handful of other countries around the world, is wrongfully detaining people, using them as political pawns, using them as leverage, uh, in a, a practice that uh, is absolutely unacceptable and that uh, we're working both broadly to, um, to try to deter, but also at the same time to try to secure the release of those who are being unjustly detained. And let me ask you, Mr. Secretary, whether you talked directly to your Russian counterpart, uh, uh, Foreign Minister Lavrov, about this. Uh, I have. I spoke to uh, Foreign Minister Lavrov uh, shortly after Evan was detained. Uh, I haven't spoken to him since. Uh, I made uh, clear the imperative of releasing Evan. I made clear the imperative of getting consular access. We did get consular access after that. We have uh, a channel that President Biden and uh, President Putin established some time ago to try to work on these, uh, these cases. Um, so we're engaged. I wish I could say that in this moment uh, there was a clear way forward. I, we don't have that in this moment, but it's something that we're working every single day. You've done something unusual in these cases, which is to impose the Levinson Act and declare the FSB, the, the Russian secret police, uh, as a target of your sanctions mm. because of wrongful detention. Tell us about that. Uh, whether that was a difficult choice to make, and what specific leverage that's going to give you in getting freedom for Evan. Look, the Levinson Act is an important tool. It gives us different and, and new authorities uh, to try to go at those who are directly engaged in wrongfully detaining journalists or wrongfully detaining our citizens. It includes things like uh, travel bans, like asset freezes. Um, and look, I think it's, it's, it's clear that in, in some cases the individuals who are sanctioned may not be planning to travel to the United States anyway. We have to acknowledge that or may not have assets here. But our hope is that by applying it, we can have a chilling effect on those who would engage in these practices going forward. There's something else, though, that's going on. For a country like Russia that has already severely isolated itself by its aggression against Ukraine, these acts only further its isolation. Increasingly, the message is don't come here, don't travel here. Whoever you are, you risk being pulled off the street and thrown in jail. And that is only going to deepen Russia's isolation. As we speak, to my knowledge, there are no reporters of American nationality 
in Russia. Uh, there are about 20 Russians who are formally accredited here with state media uh, organizations. Uh, but if this is applied uh, across the board, uh, and you see more and more countries, and the nationals of more and more countries saying, I'm not going there, that is simply going to further detach Russia from the world, and that is profoundly not in Russia's interest. Secretary of State Antony Blinken talking with Washington Post Associate Editor David Ignatius at a Washington Post program in Washington, D.C. on this 30th annual World Press Freedom Day. The group Reporters Without Borders has published its annual ranking of countries on the issue of press freedom. Russia is 164th out of 180. That's down nine slots from last year's report. From Associated Press, Russia claimed it foiled a Ukrainian drone attack on the Kremlin early Wednesday, calling it an unsuccessful assassination attempt against President Vladimir Putin and promising retaliation for what it termed a terrorist act. Ukraine denied any involvement, saying Moscow could use it for further escalation of the war. A spokesperson for Vladimir Putin telling Russian state news that Vladimir Putin was not at the Kremlin at the time, but was at his residence outside Moscow. Some reaction from the U.S. State Department with spokesperson Vedant Patel. Drone strike on the Kremlin. The secretary said anything coming out of the Kremlin should be taken with a shaker of salt. I was wondering if you had any more fidelity on what did or didn't happen. Well, I would I would echo what the what Secretary Blinken said this morning. Uh, we are uh, aware of these reports, but uh, unable to confirm the authenticity of this. Uh, but also, uh, as the secretary said. Uh, I would take anything coming from uh, the Kremlin and the Russian Federation with a uh, shaker of salt. Uh, But throughout this, it's important to remember a couple things, Nick. First, Russia invaded Ukraine. Uh, It did so unprovoked. Uh, They started this war and they could end it today if they pulled their troops out. Number two, Russia continues to fire missiles and drones at Ukraine every week. Uh, And they have done so and targeted scores of Ukrainians, including children, uh, and they have been uh, targeted places like hospitals, apartment buildings, uh, and we will. We have been very clear that we're going to continue to support Ukraine as it defends itself from Russia's invasion on this. Kylie, go ahead. Um, just to follow up on, on that specifically, you said that the U.S. has been unable to confirm the authenticity um, of these reports. Do you believe that the U.S. will be in a position over the course of the coming days to say what the U.S. believes happened here? Uh, I, I'm just not going to speculate or get ahead of the process here, uh, Kylie. What I will say, though, is that uh, we're continuing to uh, assess this and confirm the authenticity. And when we have more to update uh, or if we're in a place to, uh, we shall. And then uh, we heard from President Zelensky this morning in response to this alleged attack saying, we don't attack Putin or Moscow. How significantly should we weigh President Putin's denial that Ukraine was involved here? You mean President uh, uh, Zelensky? Uh, President Zelensky, sorry. Th- that is for uh, uh, President Zelensky and the Ukrainians to speak to. Uh, I will let them speak to their own uh, battlefield assessments and decisions. That's not something that we have ever spoken to um, uh, from here. State Department spokesperson Vedant Patel at his news conference today. BBC News writes that several Russian cities have announced they will scale back this year's Victory Day celebrations. Russian authorities have cited security reasons and attacks from pro-Ukrainian forces for the changes. But some have argued that the reduced events show the Kremlin is nervous about celebrations turning into shows of dissent against the invasion of Ukraine. Great pomp and shows of military might are the usual hallmarks of Victory Day, which marks the Soviet Union's victory over Nazi Germany on May 9th, 1945. That from BBC News. This is Washington Today. Back in the United States, Larry Hogan, former Republican governor of Maryland, says he is not going to run for the U.S. Senate in 2024. There's going to be an open seat in Maryland with the retirement announcement from Democratic Senator Ben Cardin. Larry Hogan was interviewed on News Nation Tuesday night. Has your phone stopped ringing in the past 24 hours? I turned it off, actually, because uh, (laughs) it was blowing up. I'll tell you, I'm getting a lot of calls about that. What was the most uh, unexpected call telling you to run? Well, I'm getting that, you know, I'm being called by senators and donors, and uh, I'm getting lots of inquiries from the media. But the thing that surprised me the most was that my wife said, why don't you run for the Senate, which is, you know. What'd you tell her? I told her she was crazy. I mean, I don't know. I didn't have any interest in being a senator. (laughs) 
Okay, wait, wait. We told your wife she's crazy. Okay, now saying it on national television. Uh, if you no, I told her directly. If you don't have anything to do for dinner, uh, feel free. Yeah. Uh, no, but really, you, she she said, "Why don't you run?" Yeah. Uh, you think about Maryland. You you one of the only Republicans to ever win there statewide. We've got here 2014. Uh, Larry Hogan won by 3.7%. 2018, Ben Cardin, the Democrat, 34%. Larry Hogan wins by 12%. You won re-election in 2018 in a deep blue state by 12 points. Yeah. Chris Van Hollen wins by 31. Would you? You're a guy who can swing a 50-point difference, and you wouldn't run. Why not? Well, I ran 45 points ahead of, of Donald Trump, and 2018 was a really tough, big blue wave. Yeah. We're in the bluest state in America. Um, I, you know, I, I was able to survive, but... I, I really wanted to be governor, and I loved being governor. I thought I was making a difference in my state. And you did an incredible job. So Senate's an entirely different job, and you, you're, you know, you're one of a uh, hundred people arguing all day. Uh, not a lot gets done in the Senate, um, and uh, most most former governors that I know that go into the Senate aren't really thrilled with the job. Uh, but yeah, I could I could win the race. Um, there was polls saying I would beat Van Hollen by 12 points, but it's a tough tough race, and you know, the, in a presidential year. Um, you know, it makes it even more difficult. But it's not, it's just not something I've ever aspired to do. Uh, but I am taking... Is that a hard no? You know, I, I've said... I'm, I'm not really, not, not quite Sherman-esque. I'm not, uh, you know, I've just never been interested in the job. And I've told most people, look, you know, thanks. I'm, I really, I'm flattered and I appreciate the call, but it's not something I'm pursuing. Former Maryland Governor Larry Hogan on News Nation Tuesday night, his reference to Senator Chris Van Hollen, Democrat from Maryland, Senator Holland was reelected in 2022. Larry Hogan saying some had encouraged him to run in that race. Larry Hogan also recently said he would not run for president in 2024. He was interviewed Tuesday by Leland Vittert. Maryland has not had a Republican U.S. senator since the retirement of Charles Mathias in 1986. The coronation of King Charles III in Great Britain is Saturday. Today, during Prime Minister's Question Time in the British House of Commons, the party leaders wished the king well. This exchange came at the end of a back and forth between Labour Party leader Keir Starmer and Prime Minister Rishi Sunak about economic policy and also a reference to the local elections in Great Britain happening on Thursday. Debt doubled since 2010, yeah. growth down, yeah. tax yeah. up, yeah. the economy crashed. Yeah. Mr. Speaker, they're going to need a bigger note. Yeah. <laughs> and it's right. But week after week, we debate the issues facing in this place. But, but looking beyond the elections tomorrow, we also have a hugely significant weekend coming up with the King's coronation. For most, this will be the first time they've seen a monarch crown. And I hope, and I know across the House, people will hope that people across the country enjoy the ceremony, the street parties, and of course the extra day off. 300 million will tune in. The world will see our country at its best, celebrating the beginning of a new chapter in our history. But it will also be a reminder of the loss of our late Queen, Elizabeth II, and a chance again to remember all that she gave to our country through her dedicated service. So will the Prime Minister join me in honouring our late Queen and wishing the new King a long and happy reign? Mr Mr. Speaker, as as I I said at the outset, we're all looking very much forward to the coronation. It will be a very special moment in the history uh, of our country, and I know that we will join with the country in celebrating it. But before we get to the coronation weekend, Mr Speaker, we have an important day tomorrow, and the choice before the country is clear. When they go to that ballot box, they can see a party that stands for higher council tax, higher crime, and a litany of broken promises, Mr Speaker. Meanwhile, we're getting on with delivering what we say with lower council tax, lower crime, and fewer potholes. The choice is clear. Vote Conservative, Mr Speaker. British Prime Minister Rishi Sunak, leader of the Conservative Party, with Labour Party leader Keir Starmer, main opposition, during Prime Minister's Questions in the British House of Commons today in London. And a reminder that C-SPAN will be replaying the coronation of King Charles III on Saturday, starting at 4 p.m. Eastern, expected to run about seven hours. It'll also be streamed at cspan.org. 
Thanks for listening to Washington Today. Sign up for C-SPAN's evening newsletter word for word to get the stories Washington is talking about sent to your inbox every day. Subscribe at c-span.org forward slash connect. Have a good night. Mm-hmm.